This video is three of three of the hematology series for the review of the PANS and PANRAY lecture three for paboardreview.org. In the last lecture, we started to review the anemias and some of the common causes of anemia, and we are going to pick up from where we left off. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the homeostasis of iron. You might be asking yourself, well, why is this important? Well, to give a good example, um, during the bombing raids during World War II over London, England, that was about 1940-1941, they were getting really good at treating victims of crush injuries. So they would keep these patients alive and they would be uh, doing better, but all of a sudden these patients would die. Well, they come to find out that what they described as what they described as rhabdomyolysis was that these crush injury victims, their muscles were releasing massive amounts of myoglobin. Now what was happening is that the transferrin or the proteins that are responsible for taking up extra uh, iron so that it doesn't become toxic were, were overwhelmed and the kidneys, um, they're becoming toxic and dysfunctional because of all this myoglobin and then they would die of kidney failure. So that, that's one example of why it's so important for us to tightly regulate iron in our bloodstream. So there's about four to five grams total iron in our body. Most of it's bound to hemoglobin. It's tightly regulated. It's recycled through the spleen. Two grams of ferritin complexes. Uh, ferritin is a, is a complex that holds uh, iron in our cells, uh, mainly the liver, spleen, bone marrow, but it's used for different oxidative processes. And when we look at serum ferritin, it reflects how much storage capacity we have. Are we storing more? Are we storing less? The serum ferritin gives us an idea with that. So another thing that we like to look at is the um, transferrin. Now that's three to four milligrams, not grams, but three to four milligrams. And what that tells us is that measures the body's capacity to bind to iron. Transferrin is, is responsible for that. And the TIBC is the total iron binding capacity. Okay, How much capacity do we have to bind to iron? And a serum iron, um, that's the laboratory measure that is the amount of circulating iron that is bound to transferrin. And then we have something called transferrin saturation, or TSAT, okay? That measures the percentage, okay? So it's like a ratio of the serum iron and the total iron binding capacity. We multiply that by 100. And of the transferrin that is available to bind um, iron, that value tells us how much serum iron is actually bound. So how much of our storage or capacity to bind to iron do we have? How much do we have used up? So for example, a value of 15 means that 15% 15 of the iron binding sites of the transferrin are being occupied. Okay. So our bodies don't have a way of excreting any iron. So if we get too much, we're kind of screwed. But we do have a loss about of one to two milligrams per day, depending on our situation. Females, because of menstruation, lactation, um, will uh, lose more. Remember, we we have thousands of micro traumas, the mucosal lining of our GI tract. Um, we lose um, we lose some blood, and um, and it's tightly rec uh, regulated by the uh, and recycled. Um, through the reticuloendothelial cells. So the only way we have um, of restoring those is by absorption through our GI tract. So some of the things I listed that we have to think, okay, is there anything preventing us from getting enough iron? One is diet. You got to think of diet. Usually it's not a problem here in the United States, but in many other countries, diet, not getting enough um, iron in their diet. We have a lot of iron fortified um, foods. Crohn's disease, celiac sprue, anything that causes inflammation, irritation in our, our GI tract that messes with the function and the absorption of iron can give us problems. So some of the, those are some of the things we have to look at. Okay, who am I? So let's say you 
get some lab values. The serum ferritin is decreased. Um, that, remember, is an indirect indication of the storage capacity that our, um, our organs have. There's a certain amount that our organs have they need, they store them, but we look at the serum ferritin because we can't measure that directly. Next, our total iron binding capacity increases. So the serum iron, the transferrin, um, our body wants more. So that's starting to bind more um, iron. A third thing that happens is you start to get microcytic hypochromic so that there's starting to be changes in the red blood cells okay and you see smaller red blood cells and the hemoglobin concentration um, is going down. What do you think of? Iron deficiency anemia. So some of the common causes, so this is kind of the pattern. So the seroferritin goes down telling us our storages are low in our organs, the total iron binding capacity increases because our body wants uh, more iron and then the red blood cells, they're the last to be affected. The MCHC, remember, is the mean corpuscular hemoglobin concentration. Um, that will start to go on, down. So some of the causes can be dysfunctional uterine bleeding, GI bleeding, pregnancies as your demand goes up, you can't meet those demands, and then um, adolescents with growth spurts, and that's why we have screening for um, some of these kids um, when they come to see the pediatrician. The treatment is ferrous sulfate. So looking at the analogy of a red blood cell and its components being a, a cart on a train, um, when we talk about vitamin B12 deficiency, we have a problem with the structure. You're still able to build the red blood cell, but the structure is um, incorrect. Some of the things that can cause pernicious anemia mainly are the absorption of B12. Uh, pernicious anemia, we'll talk about that on the next side. Crohn's disease, gastric surgery, uh, you're, you're eliminating the ability to to absorb the vitamin B12 or even strict vegans can um, uh, decrease their uh, their nutritional intake of that. So as we said the train car is formed so you get a macrocytic so it's too big. You get a macrocytic hypochromic meaning there's not enough uh, hemoglobin to carry the oxygen. Uh, a common complaint is a loss of vibratory sensor, some a test that can be performed to kind of lead you in this direction. The treatment is to bypass the absorption and give a shot and so you know the patient gets that B12. Okay so who is pernicious anemia? We know pernicious anemia is a vitamin B12 deficiency. B12 sometimes is referred to as cobalamine. They might use that on the test. So who who is it? Well Males greater than 50s, they're smokers, they're drinkers, they lack the intrinsic factor, which is a glycoprotein produced by the parietal cells of the stomach, and that's necessary for the absorption of vitamin B12 later on in the terminal ileum. So who told you to stop making intrinsic factor? You did. It's autoimmune in nature. So there's a higher rate of gastritis um, leading to gastric cancer. Uh, the treatment of choice for flare-ups are steroids uh, like prednisone. So how do you detect or how do you determine uh, whether uh, the vitamin B12, where, where is the problem coming from? Um, is it pernicious anemia? So we perform what's called the Schilling's test. Now I never really knew what the Schilling's test until I looked into it and it makes sense. So there's four stages. With stage one, you get two doses of vitamin B12. The first dose is an oral form, it's radioactive, and it is given by mouth. An hour later you're given a shot um, of B12, and then from there on you're collecting a 24-hour urine sample. So the urine is checked to see if you are absorbing the vitamin P12 normally. If this is abnormal, then you go to stage two. Uh, which can be done two to three or three to seven days later. In stage two, you're given radioactive B12 along with intrinsic factor. So this can tell us whether your vo low vitamin B12 is caused by a problem with your stomach, preventing it from uh, producing the intrinsic factor. 
If this stage is abnormal, you can go to stage three. So this stage is done after you're given uh, two weeks of a uh, antibiotic to see if abnormal bacterial growth has caused um, you to not be able to absorb vitamin B12. And then, then you can have a stage four. Um, if that doesn't take care of the problem, you're giving pancreatic enzymes for three days and then you're given a radioactive dose of vitamin P12. And that's uh, the Schilling's test. So if you look at lab results and you detect decreased iron, decreased total iron binding capacity, increased ferritin, what is this consistent with? A, iron deficiency anemia, B, anemia of chronic disease, C, thalassemia trait, or D, lead poisoning? The answer is anemia of chronic disease. It's a normal chromic, normal cytic anemia. Some of the causes can be lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, CRF. So a range of underlying conditions can uh, cause a release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. These cytokines trigger a change in the intracellular iron metabolism. Uh, as a result, serum iron falls and erythropoiesis um, is uh, retarded and it causes anemia. Sometimes uh, erythropoietin receptors in the kidneys can uh, be affected. You got to remember these autoimmune diseases, these autoantibodies bump around into a lot of things and they can um, uh, irritate a lot of these receptors that are responsible for other things. Okay, so a 55 year old woman presents with a chief complaint of easy bruising, gum bleeding when she brushes her teeth. She has no personal or family history of bleeding disorders and is currently taking no medications. Physical exam reveals multiple purple spots, one to five millimeters on the mucosal membranes of her mouth. She has no prior history of such episodes. There is no lymphadenopathy or splenomegaly. CBC reveals a platelet count of 12 times 10 to the third per microliter. All other cell lines are within normal limits. The peripheral blood smear shows thrombocytopenia but no other abnormalities. What is the diagnosis and what is the treatment? One, observation and sometimes prednisone, one to two milligrams per kg, PO for three weeks, then taper. Two, IV, IVIG. Three, platelet transfusion or four, splenomegaly. The answer is on the next slide. So the diagnosis is ITP, idiopathic thrombocytopenia purpura. It causes increased bleeding due to low platelet count. Females more than in males. It can be post-viral, so you can clinically see bruising, petechiae, nosebleeds. It's when a platelet count get, gets below 30,000, and that prolo prolongs what? Bleeding time. That's because bleeding time is responsible for that primary platelet plug, and if you don't have enough of them, then you're going to see uh, in the capillaries, you're going to see those... Uh, that those thrombi there. And the normal range is 250,000 and the treatment sometimes is none and sometimes steroids. The next coagulopathy that we're going to discuss might present something like this. A 40 year old African American woman with a BMI of 50 with a two week history of malaise, fatigue, diarrhea, and vomiting presents. She is slightly confused. There's petechiae on her lower extremities, otherwise, the exam is unremarkable. Lab tests show a hematocrit of 25, platelets of 10,000, lactate dehydrogenase is elevated, serum creatinine is 1.1. The peripheral smear shows fragmented red blood cells, also known as schistocytes and an elevated reticulocyte count. Which of the following do you expect to see on coagulation labs? So what she has is TTP, also known as thrombotic thrombocytopenia purpura. What's happening here is the platelets are affected. So <clears throat> schistocytes um, are fragmented red blood cells and they look something like um, you see there on peripheral blood smear. As we talked before, von Wildebrand uh, factor plays a two-fold role in the hemostasis of coagulation. It acts as a carrier protein for factor VIII and it protects it from being degraded. There's an enzyme that's responsible for cutting the von Wildebrand factor to be released as a um, gap for 
the endothelia that is exposed and what happens in this disease is that is not functioning properly so what will happen is these these um, the lack of this function of the enzyme um, will interact and trigger aggregation of platelets um, circulating platelets at the site of high um, intervascular shearing stress areas and microthrombi um, will occur in microvascular system hence the petechiae um, <clears throat> so that's what's causing these symptoms so the micro um, thrombi you think about the the purpura the neurological symptoms headaches confusion blurred vision seizures the fever renal symptoms so all those things can help they and that's why the bleeding times affected so fresh frozen plasma or plasma exchange is very important because this has a high mortality rate and you better make sure you have a, a consult with hematology also the next vignette is uh, a presentation that you might see with our next coagulopathy a 12 month old boy presents with a sudden onset vomiting and temperature of 102 degrees Fahrenheit on examination the child is irritable tachycardic has pallor with cold extremities there is a diffuse skin rash with abdominal petechiae and signs of nuchal rigidity lab tests show leukocytosis thrombocytopenia with increased PT and PTT and decrease in fibrinogen. There's ele elevated fibrin de degradation product and elevated BUN with metabolic acidosis. A spinal tap is positive for gram negative cocci and CSF and meningococcal is confirmed. So we know this patient has um, meningitis, is probably septic. So we're looking at what's called disseminated intervascular coagulopathy. And what happens is that this uh, degraded um, fibrin product is really a D-dimer. Um, it's caused when uh, the scaffolding is created by fibrinogen or fibrin is turned to fibrin. Fibrinogen is cross-links with platelets called fibrin, but this is a cascade that gets out of control and it consumes the procoagulation and the platelets. So it's always secondary to a secondary, it's always caused by a secondary underlying disorder, but what happens is your homeostasis for your coagulation gets out of um, sync because you, you used up all the coagulation factors too quickly and then you can't control uh, bleeding. So that's why both the PT and PTT is used up, the platelets are um, used up, and you have li low fibrinogen with a positive D-dimer. So the treatment is fresh frozen plasma, and this is where you'll need a consult, but possibly heparin to prevent uh, blood activation. I would like to thank Joe and all of the time and energy is put into helping us prepare and pass the pants or pan ray. Come join us at paboardreview.org. Please send your feedback and comments to wes at paboardreview.org.